Welcome everybody to our Let's Talk About Relationship series. Today we're on part two of this series, Choosing a Life Partner. Welcome everybody once more. I know a lot of our Next Geners are watching these uh, in homes and in groups. Shout out to our Next Geners. And now is a really good time if you know somebody who could be blessed by this teaching today, you can actually share the Vimeo through the three dots at the top of your screen above the video. Share it with somebody whom you think will need it, would be blessed by it, and then they can join uh, as Pastor Benny is going to be teaching us. So today's session is broken down into two segments, two teaching segments and two Q&A segments. Mm -hmm. But you can begin asking questions by clicking the blue Ask button at the bottom of the chat. And as you ask those questions, we will review them, we'll look through them, and hopefully we can get as many questions as we can answer. So without further ado, let's thank look you. to Pastor Benny, whom we've been looking forward to today. Well, thank you so much for joining me uh, tonight. And tonight we're going to be addressing a very important issue of choosing a life partner. Now to me, there are two major decisions that uh, a man has got to make, a woman has got to make uh, in life. Uh, one is the God that we will worship. And number two, is the person that we will marry. And these two critical decisions is going to determine um, how happy we will be in life, really. So tonight, I, I hope to be able to give us some pointers from the Bible on how we can make a better choice of a life partner. And to help frame this whole thing up in scriptures, I'm going to take you to a very familiar passage in Genesis 24. And I'm going to read for you Genesis 24 from verse 10 to verse 27. And then I pick up verse 55 to 50 to 67. Okay, so allow me to read this beautiful narrative of a servant who is looking for a wife for his master. So we go to Genesis 24. I start reading from verse 10. And then the servant left, taking with him ten of his master's camels, loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. And he set out for Aram Naharim and made his way to the town of Nahor. And he had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. And it was toward evening, and the time when the women go out to draw water. And then he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And then she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one that you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with a jar on her shoulder. And she was the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. And the woman was very beautiful, a virgin, and no man has ever slept with her. And she went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. And after he had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for my camels too, until they have enough to drink. So she quickly emptied a jar into the trout, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord has given him uh, success. And when the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring weighing a becca and two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels. And then he said, Whose daughter are you? And she answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son that Milcah bore to Nahor. And she added, We have plenty of straw and fodder as well as room for you to spend the night. And then the man bowed down, worshipped the Lord, saying, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord had led me on a camp in the journey to the house of my master's relatives. And then we go down to verse 55, and I'll pick up the story from there. But her brother and her mother replied, Let the young woman remain with us ten days or so, and then you may go. But he said to them, Do not detain me, now that the Lord has granted success to my journey. Send me on my way so that I may go to my master. And then they said, Let's call the young woman and ask her about it. And so they called Rebekah and asked her, Will you go with this man? 
And she said, I will go. So they sent their sister Rebecca on her way along with the nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, Our master, may you in our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands, and may your offspring possess the cities of her enemies. Then Rebecca and the attendants got ready, mounted the camels, and went back with the men. So the servant took Rebekah and left. Now Isaac has come from Beer Lahor Roy, where he was living in the Negev. And he went out to the field one evening to meditate or to pray. And as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebekah also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? And she said, He is my master. The servant answered. So he took a whale and covered herself. And then the servant told Rebecca, uh, told Isaac all that he had done. And Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Amen. What a beautiful story. We're going to pray before I talk to you. Father, thank you for your wonderful word. And we pray that may this word unveil principles for us as we seek to discern the, the person that we should choose as a life partner. We commit this time to you and I pray that you make this a time where it's fruitful for all of us who are listening in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Abraham was on the verge of his promotion to heaven. In other words, he was nearing his deathbed. So he summoned his trusted servant and sent him on a special mission. What was that mission? Uh, Genesis 24 verse 3 tell us this. Then he said to the servant, You will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, amongst whom I am living, because uh, Abraham at that time was living among the Canaanites. But you will go to my country and my own relatives, and you get a wife for my son Isaac. Now, how many of you agree that this is an awesome responsibility? And it tells us uh, also of the great relationship that Abraham had with his trusted servant that he actually entrusted this task of looking for a life partner to the servant uh, on behalf of his son, Isaac. And the problem was the servant actually didn't know how to do it. So on the way, he did the best thing he, he, he could do, which is to pray. So he prayed and he laid a fleece before the Lord. And in verse 14, the scripture tells us this, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today. This was the servant's prayer. And show kindness to my master Abraham. May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And then she also said, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for my servant Isaac. Now, the story that unfolded thereafter became a classic story of romance and love that I think is worthy of a K-pop drama. You know, the servant's search for a suitable mate for his own master's son, I think, contained precious principles that outlive time and tide to remain applicable even in today's contemporary society. Now, the settings and the method methods may change, but I believe the principles still remain. Now, I understand that in Genesis 26, it may be difficult for us today to culturally identify with arranged marriages because we don't practice that, uh, not that much anymore. Uh, maybe in some sense, we are going back to it with all the dating apps that are going on. In some sense, it is arranged marriage. It's almost like trying to match you with somebody, which is the principle in the Old Testament, right? However, the principles for choosing a mate, I think, will still apply to all of us today. Now, I, so you allow me now to outline for you 10 keys that I see in this story uh, of, for choosing a life partner. And here are the 10 keys. Key number one is this, is the wisdom of seeking counsel. I'd like you to notice that Isaac was not the only one that's involved in the choosing of his life partner. There were others that were involved in the process. For example, the father, Abraham, initiated the process. Uh, the servant prayed. God intervened. The girl was willing. The in-laws agreed. And the couple made, however, the couple was the one who made the final decision. So you will see that in the whole process, a trusted servant and a devoted father were involved. And I think there is wisdom amongst many counsellors. So young people, if you are watching and you are a young person, can I encourage you to see your parents and your spiritual leaders 
as a source of wisdom rather than a hindrance. Um, I, I say this cautiously, but chances are that if you marry someone against uh, your parents, your pastors or your mentors' advice, we are likely to go into dangerous ground, really. Uh, but I say this cautiously. But if we don't listen to counsellors and to advice, we are likely to step into dangerous ground. And this is especially true if your counsellors, if your parents, your, your, your mentors, you know, your, your spiritual leaders, they love God and they have your best interests at heart. The need for counsellors became even more critical because when we are so madly in love, so to speak, our emotions tend to overwhelm our better judgment. We become so entangled emotionally uh, to, be, to be objective, you know. And so we ended up missing the most obvious signs of weakness in the other party. In fact, we had the tendency to end up seeing what we want to see and then we somehow screen out those things that we don't want to see. So my challenge to you, young people, will be this. When you come to that pivotal point of deciding if we should enter into a serious relationship, seek the wisdom of others, those who love you. Get the views of your pastors. Talk to your, pa uh, talk to your parents. Talk to your leaders. Don't try and go it alone. Uh, and don't be deceived by the mere flutter of the heart uh, because you don't just want to follow your heart but you also want to engage your head as well because you are making a choice here and I pray that you will be a wise choice. So there is this principle of the importance of um, seeking counsel. Here's principle number two. That's the principle of being equally yoked. In verse 4 of chapter 26, you notice that, the, uh, that um, Abraham says to the servant, Go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. You notice that Abraham's main concern was that the son would marry within the same faith, within the same tribe. And this is the principle of being equally yoked. I think the Apostle Paul talks about this also in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 to 16. Now, although the context of that has to do with religion, but I think it is also in line um, with the principle of choosing a life partner. So let me read for you verse uh, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 onwards. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? And what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And the Apostle Paul here used the, the concept of a yoke. Uh, the word yoke actually refers to a harness that kind of put two oxen together so that they can plough the field together. Now, you need to understand that once they are yoked together, they must go in the same direction, they must do the same things at the same time because you are tied up together. And God loves you and He wants the best for you. And He knows the amount of challenges that can come uh, if we marry an, a pre-believer. Now, I have personally seen so many Christians and we counseled so many couples who married in an unequally yoked manner and then they regretted it for years to come. Amos chapter 3, verse 3, the prophet also says, do two walk together unless they be agreed. Take for example, when the children comes along, whose values do they adopt? That's already in itself a big question. And in the long run, I always find that one party will have to give up their values to flow with the other. And usually, I've noticed, it is the Christian that would actually give way. And the concept is really quite simple. If I can draw a little picture here for you, uh, just to show you what I mean by this. Now, imagine if you can, here's a chair, and the Christian is up here. Let's say it's a girl, okay? So this girl is up here, this Christian girl is up here. And so what she's trying to do is to try and pull her, her non-Christian boyfriend to come up to where she is. But at the same time, she, he's also trying to pull her down to where he is. Now, in, under this circumstance, who do you think is likely to win? 
who do you think is likely to win? The answer is obvious, right? It's likely, it's more likely for the boy to be able to put a girl down than the other way around. Why? Because the law of gravity actually works against the one on top. See, the law of gravity just works against us. In the same way, the law of sin will work against us when we try to do this tussle, you see. And we need to be real and actually face up to these facts. And, and when this happens, uh, when, when this tussle goes on between the two, uh, we actually become a hindrance to the person coming to Christ. Now, sometimes we think, don't worry, I'll get married to him and, or her and then I'll, I'll get them converted. No, but actually, we may actually become a hindrance to them because your compromise already convinced him or her that your God is not that great since you actually are willing to choose the person above your God. Now, I'm not saying at the same time, please understand me, I'm not saying at the same time that I've never seen an unequally yoked situation turn out to be good because I have. I have seen uh, situations where unequally yoked uh, marriages actually turn out well in the end, where the non-Christian actually became Christians and then they go on to live very uh, happy lives. So, so I, I, I'm not saying that it can never work, but my point is that when it does happen, it is by the mercy of God that it takes place. Because on top of that, for one case that turned out well, there could be two that turn out miserable. And the truth is this, as believers, you need to understand, good results coming out of carnal decisions does not make it right. The bottom line issue is one of obedience to God's commands. And I think this can also be further applied to spiritual compatibility as well. And here we are referring not so much to just spiritual position, like, you know, a cell leader must marry a cell leader, a pastor must marry. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm talking here about compatibility in terms of passion, in terms of devotion. And, and please, can I say this to you? Uh, never mistake a guy's zealousness. Uh, uh, ladies, can I say this? You know, never mistake a guy's zealousness for spirituality. Uh, don't go out with a person simply because they turn up at every prayer meeting and every seminar. This may be indicators of spiritual passion and, and, but not absolute proof of godliness. So I would say take time to know the person in a group setting until you are convinced that his or her walk with God is real and authentic. Okay, so that's principle number two, the principle of being equally yoked. Here's number three, it's the beauty of purity. It's the beauty of purity. In verse 16 of the passage we just read, the Bible tells us that the girl was very beautiful, a virgin, and no man has ever laid with her. In other words, she was a woman of chastity. And can I say this? Chastity is the greatest gift that you can give to your future partner. And let us learn to honour our bodies as a temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, every time we get into illicit relationship and we surrender our bodies, you know, to the youthful passion of, say, premarital sex or adultery, our desires will soon degenerate into disrespect, and disrespect will degenerate into contempt. Now, here's a, a little illustration for you. I think sex is a little bit like an adhesive tape, you know. Uh, it sticks very well, you know, the first few times. But if we keep pulling it out and then changing surface and we keep changing surface, after a while, it loses its ability to stick. You understand what I'm saying? And, and it, 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 in the same way, if we keep running from one partner to another, after a while, sex loses its meaning. You see, and that is why I want to urge you young people, be careful of the moments that you spend alone as a couple. Um, don't be in a situation where you are alone and out of excess of either family or the public because it is um, dangerous in that sense. Uh, sex is sacred and is worth waiting for. So I will challenge you, keep your purity as your greatest gift for your future spouse. And not only, will the couple cons not only should the couple consider the holiness of God, we also should consider the purity of others. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, the writer of Hebrews says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And 
Young people, we need to take time to consider, to think about, to muse, to take notice of the implication of the things that we are doing. Because if we are not careful, we can end up stealing something that belongs to somebody else's future spouse. You know, and, and my question is this. Would, do you agree that the rules of marriage should not be applied to dating? Would you agree? I, I think you would, right? The rules of marriage should not be applied to, the, to, 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 to dating. What do I mean by that? Um, nothing is settled okay, until we say, I do at the altar. Okay, nothing is settled until then. So when dating couples or courting couples do break up, okay, please don't treat them like as if they are divorced because they are not. Okay, because the whole purpose of courtship is so that they can find out, the whole purpose of this serious dating is so that they can find out if they are suitable for each other. And if they found out that they are not, then it's better to face it now and break it up than to go on and regret later. See, so I think that the rules of courtship should never be, the rules of marriage should never be applied to courtship or dating. See, and the principle is here, don't settle. And young people, hear me on this. When it comes to choosing a life partner, don't settle. You marry because you really want to. You don't marry because, you know, people say things like, oh, I think we better marry because we've been going out for the last seven years. And then if you find you're not suitable, don't just marry. Don't settle. You know, don't marry because what will other people say? Don't marry because I think her parents will kill me. Don't marry for all that. You marry because you really want to marry the person. Don't settle. And it, now, if, you, if we accept, therefore, now, if you know that courtship and dating is not the end game uh, until you actually get married, then please remember this. If we accept that the rules of marriage do not apply to courtship or or, or to dating or engagement, then don't take the privilege as well. And what is the privilege of getting married? Basically one thing, and that's to be able to sleep together, sex, right? So if you don't want the rules applied to you, the rules of marriage applied to you, then don't take the privilege as well. Okay, and I want to challenge all of us as young people, next gen, you know, we live a life of purity. And we keep our chastity to be a best gift that we can give to our future spouse. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 has this very uh, poignant verse that goes like this. Paul says, Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? And, and then he goes on to say, For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. And then he compares it to something else. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. What a profound comparison. The Apostle Paul actually con compared sex to the awesome experience of worship. He actually placed this physical act of, of sexual intercourse next to the, our, the spiritual experience of worship. See, when we worship, we actually become one with the Lord. That's as intimate as you can come with God. But when we have sexual intercourse, we too become one with, our, with the partner in body. There is something so profound, something so deep that takes place between a man and a woman through the sexual act that it makes it unlike any other experience that a man can go through. And we need to take this seriously. You see, why? Because every time the, the, through the sexual act, there is a soul tie that is formed. Uh, through, the, through the sexual act of, of sex, a soul tie is actually formed between a man and a woman. That tie of intimacy is so profound. And we need to understand that. See, and so let me draw a picture for you here, okay? And I hope you, you understand this. Uh, say, I'm marrying a man and a woman. Okay, I'm marrying this man and this woman in holy matrimony. So as the pastor, I'm now marrying them. But I thought I'm marrying two persons. But spiritually speaking, imagine if this girl, before he is married to this man, he already had sex with another man. Then what happened? There is a soul tie 
between this man and this and 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 this and this bride. Okay. Now imagine if this man also had sex with another girl. Then here's another tie that is all linked up. And this girl happened to have sex with another man. And then this man happened to have sex with another man. And so you have all these ties that are, are, are all there in the unseen realm, in the spiritual realm. And this man, imagine if he also had premarital sex with another girl, and then this girl had another one with another man, and it all ties up. So listen, while I'm marrying this one couple, they are bringing along with them all their soul ties of all their past encounters. Are you with me? And this is so profound. They have... Then there is that soul tie that needs to be broken. And that's why in premarital counseling, we always ask people to break their soul ties so that we don't bring all these other people along with us, spiritually speaking. And this is how critical the, the sexual act is. And we need to take it seriously. And can I challenge you, young people, never, never yield to peer pressure. I know we live in a promiscuous society today, society where everybody does it like, anywhere and, and anyhow. And, and it's, it's, it's not uncommon to find people losing their virginity at a very young age. But here's my challenge to you as believers. Never yield to peer pressure. If anyone tries to apply pressure on you and said, why are you still a virgin when everybody else is not? And, and they get you to conform to their promiscuous world, you just remind that person, for me to become like you takes only one night. For you to become like me, never. And you keep your chastity and your purity. Now, some of you here, as I say all this, you may be thinking, what if I've already violated myself? Well, I've got good news for you too. God hates the sin, but He loves the sinner. And we serve a God who is able to forgive. We serve a God who is able to restore. There is always a new beginning that we can have in Christ. If our value is not found in our bodies, but it's found in Christ, then even if we have in the past crossed the line of morality, I want you to know that God's grace is greater than all of our past sin. And our God is in the business of restoration. The key is a willingness to repent and to walk away from our sin and then to begin to live in obedience. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says this, Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Psalms 103 verse 11 and 12. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. How far is the east from the west? It's infinitely far, isn't it? That's how far God has removed our sin from us. Infinitely gone. And principle number four is this. It's the benefit of shared inheritance. Look at verse 7 now, where the, Lord, the, the scripture wrote this. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying, to your offspring, I will give this land, Abraham said, and he will send his angel before you so that you will get a wife from my son from there. You see, Abraham knew that Isaac had an inheritance in the Lord because he is, his, he is Abraham's offspring and his future mate, his future life partner is going to have a part of that destiny as well. Now, in the choice of a mate, one would, would have to bear in mind this, that the mission and the destiny that God has placed into our life need to be shared with our life partner. See? And that's why I always say there are three M's in life, and I can outline them for you. The first M is master, most important. You know, I had a total of um, two failed relationships uh, before I met my wife. Um, and I remember when I, after breaking up with the first girlfriend and I was I wanted to get into a second relationship my mentor at that time actually told me this in no uncertain terms he sat me down and he said to me Benny 
why don't you concentrate on knowing God first? At that time, I was still going through my tertiary studies and he actually advised me, he said, why don't you concentrate on knowing God first? Because if you know God, you will know the person you ought to marry. But I didn't listen and I ended up with the next relationship and I ended up with the pain of another broken relationship. But I, today, I will say that to all my young people that get to know your master first. Because once you know your master, then you, have, you will know the second M, which is mission. Then you will know your mission. There are so many people who have shipwrecked their life mission and their destiny because of a poor choice of a life partner. Their God-given dreams and visions must now be shelved, you know, because their partner don't share their passion, don't share their mission. But once we know our master, we will know our mission. And once we know our mission, then we can choose our mate. You see, everyone is complete in themselves, but two is better than one. See, if I stay single, I'm complete in myself, but two is better than one. See, and if I can find a life partner that can share my destiny, how good is that? And that is why I always believe that two candles, when a husband and a wife comes together, they are like two candles. Two candles coming together, they must burn brighter for the Lord. If not, why come together? If you come together and your luminance actually drop, then something is wrong. See, and I know that some of us here may have already made our choice of a mate even before we actually discover our mission. Now, what do you do in, that, in those cases? I think God is so gracious. He will overrule and He can still bless you with a marriage that is God-honouring, that is kingdom advancing. Now, they can both still seek to grow in obedience to God and to come into alignment with His will. But can I encourage you that if you have not yet made your choice, why don't you follow this order, master, mission, and then your mate. And when you're choosing your mate, I'll show you one more picture here uh, just to help you to see this. Um, when my daughters reach the age of 16, I sit them down and I tell them, and I draw them this picture. And there are three C's that you need to think about when you're choosing your life partner. The first C is chemistry. Let's not kid ourselves. Some people we mix, we, we have chemistry, some people we don't. Now, it's not physics, it's not, it's not biology. I think in the end, it's chemistry. You know, we got to have chemistry. And chemistry is when you say you have the same likes and dislikes. You know, you, you have certain common interests. You actually enjoy being with each other. Uh, you actually find that when we come together, when we talk, we actually enjoy it. So that's great to have chemistry. And once you have chemistry, you make great friends. Okay, Anyone with chemistry can become your good friends. And that's what we need, chemistry. But if you're looking for a life partner, you've got to look beyond just we can all have a good time together. It's more than chemistry. You also now need to look at character. Because... Character is what ultimately will rule the game. You know, when we are friends, we can all have a good time together. But when we, when we are living together, you need to look at character. Character is where all the character traits kick in. Do you like the person in terms of his integrity? Do they have the right personality type? You know, so all these are kicking in. It has to do with character, your personality, the traits that the person has. You need to look at that seriously if you're looking for a life partner. But ultimately, it's not just chemistry and character. You need to look at the core of the person. This is the, the core of the person. This has to do with values. It has to do with their faith. It has to do with the things that are important to them, the value system, the things that drive the person. Now, if you have chemistry, you make good friends. If you have the right character mix, then I think you can make good partners. These are people you can work with, okay? not just play with, but these are people you can work with and actually uh, do things together with. But to, to look for a life partner, what we need is more than just friends and partners. We actually need a soulmate. And to have a soulmate, we need to look at values. We need to look at their what their faith, you know, the things are really important to them. Their convictions, we are dealing with the deep inner things. So think about that as well, okay? So here's number 
4 okay, have to do with shared inheritance. And just one more before we take a break. And that's the presence of willingness. Okay, this I think we all would agree. If we look at verse 8 of the passage, it says, If a woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you are released from this oath of mine. The servant is asking Abraham, what if I, I think that's the right woman, but the woman won't come back with me? And then Abraham said, if the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you re, you'll be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. Then in verse 57, when, when the servant actually found Rebecca, then what happened? The family then said to the servant, Let's call the girl and ask her about it. And so they asked Rebecca, they called her Rebecca and they asked her, will you go with this man? And who made the decision? Rebecca did. She said, I will go. In other words, Rebecca was willing. Okay. And what was Isaac's response to Rebecca? Was Isaac willing? I think so. Obviously, he was also keen to have Rebecca. How would I know? Because I think they must have some electricity. They must have got some mutual attraction. How do I know that? Verse 63 tells us this. That Isaac went out to the field one evening to meditate or to pray. And as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebekah also looked up and saw Isaac. In other words, it was that moment. And then she said to the servant, who is that man in the field coming to meet us? So obviously, she must have seen something she liked. So she asked, who is this man? And apparently, they must have caught each other's eyes at that moment. He must have been praying. I, I can imagine Isaac was praying uh, for the success of the servant. And then oh, when he looked up, he saw this beautiful woman coming. She looked up at the same time and then they got the electric zap. And then the next thing you know, he came towards her. She also became interested and asked about him. Wow, imagine how excited they must be. And you notice also, it didn't take them too long before they got married. And there must be willingness before there can be a match. In other words, brothers and sisters, there is this principle of choice. We choose now, before there can be willingness, there must be a freedom to choose on both sides. So please do not give me this, the Lord spoke to me that you are the one rubbish. You know? <laughs> don't go there. And don't you ever let this kind of super spiritual talk entice you into a relationship that you are not comfortable to be in. Don't just let people using super spiritual talk lure you into something like that. And, and listen, young people, don't ever force your will onto another person and don't manipulate someone into a relationship with you. True love never operates that way. Remember what 1 Corinthians 13.5 says, love is not rude, it is not self-seeking. Okay, there is this principle of choice. Now that brings me to a very important question that often plagues us. The question is this, does God have a perfect one for me somewhere out there? Does God have a perfect choice for me? You know, if you actually say that and you believe that, what you're actually saying is that there is one out of the 7 billion people or so out there who is meant for you. And if you miss that perfect one, then that's it. Is that, what you're, is that what we actually believe? Does this idea of God's perfect one actually hold water? Now, let me illustrate this one for you, okay? And watch this uh, so that it, I, let me set you free from this. <laughs> now, they, some people think there is this perfect one. So, so A is actually meant to be married to B. That's the perfect one. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. A didn't marry B, but A went to marry C, which is not his perfect one. But actually C was meant for D, which is his perfect one. But because D, C is gone, so D had no choice, marry E, which is not the perfect one. But because 
Now E is married to D. Actually, E is meant for F, but F can no longer marry E because E is married to D. So F had no choice but to marry G, which is also not the perfect one. So what's my point? My point is this. If you actually believe there's only one perfect one waiting for you, if you miss it, it is gone, then all we need is one joker to make a mistake and everybody else will have a domino effect. <laughs> Are you understanding what I'm saying? So really, we need to think about this again. Is there really the perfect one that we're all waiting for? Maybe not. Now, what does the Bible actually say about this? I know we all heard stories of how God is our matchmaker and it all come together. Now, I don't discount that. There could be specific instances where God really put two persons together and no one else and is by supernatural bringing together. That's great. And, but I can't say that that's the general principle applied across the board. What does the Bible actually say about this? You look at Numbers 36 verse 6. Listen to this. This is what the Lord commanded for Jelifahad's daughter. They may marry anyone they please as long as they marry within the tribal clan of their father. Now, this was exactly what Abraham did with his son Isaac marrying within his tribe. And this is the only criteria, definitive boundary of choice, if I can put it that way. Now, what about the New Testament? Does the New Testament say anything about this? I think it's further emphasized in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 39. Listen to what Paul says here. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes. But... He must belong to the Lord. Now, there you have it. We must marry within the family of God in the New Testament. Just like in the Old Testament, the people must marry within their tribe. So can I put it into a picture form for you now? Okay, look at this chart here. The PowerPoint will show you that we have the whole world. Okay, and in the world, there are lots of people that you can choose to marry. But out of the whole world, God has given us a boundary. You must marry within the family of God. So that's out of the whole world, there's the family of God. But out of the family of God, there is a range of good choices that is particularly suited for you. Are you with me? It's not the whole world. It's not just everybody in the family of God. But within the family of God, there is a range of good choices that will, be, that will make a good mate for you. And within that biblical boundary, we have a range of good choices. Then you are free to choose the one that fits you best. And it's not so much the perfect one, but rather the best one that you like. Okay? And this will naturally take into consideration your master, your mission, and even your methods, including your conviction about jobs, uh, your conviction about money, your conviction about children, your conviction about family, about house, etc., etc. Okay, and the key is this. Listen carefully to this and don't miss this, okay? There is no perfect one. But once you are married, be the perfect one. Okay? Um, God is not so concerned. It's not only concerned that you choose the right one, but please remember this. You must also be the right one. Okay? And another way that my wife likes to put it is this. To find a Mr. Right, you must first be Miss Right. And I think that's good advice. There is no perfect one, but once you are married, then be the perfect one. I think this is a good point to pause <laughs> and let all this sink in for a while. Okay? I'm going to pass this time now to Dan. Well, that was so good, Pastor Benny. Uh, I think there's so much gold and there's so much Thank you. diamonds in there. Uh, so we want to give some time for mm. everyone just to soak it all in a little bit. Mm. Um, and we are going to go back to part two of the teaching and also the Q&A just before that. But be before we go into that, um, is my privilege to let you know 
that this particular webinar and the series was brought to you by two amazing organizations, one of which is FCC Faith Community Church. And if you feel that you want to participate and to join in this mission with FCC to bless the city and the nations beyond and the ministries beyond, mm. feel free to go on to FCC.life where we have a giving tab and you can continue to contribute to the church and the ministries. Or if you're living in Singapore, you can also contribute to the second organization that has worked together to bring this uh, into fruition, Thank and that you. is Arrows Resources. So the pay now as well as the bank uh, details are uh, available for you on screen right now, and you can choose to contribute to the ministry as well. So uh, there have been a fair bit of questions. Okay. Uh, and the first question is a million dollar question yes. that I think uh, all the singles who are watching this particular webinar would love to have answered. Okay. So, um, and the question goes like this. What is the most appropriate way to approach or initiate mm. courtship? The first step to start off the relationship. What yeah. is the appropriate way to start off? Mm. Well, I would think that um, we start off by being with uh, in, in a setting where everybody is in a group, you know. I think that's where it's a really good place to start because um, I found that when, when people are uh, just in a group and let's say a cell group or ministry group, people are just themselves, you know, and... But when you start off with a one-on-one -on -one mm. thing, people all put on their best front. So if you really want to get to know a person, you better get to know them when they're in a group and they're just being themselves. So what you see is what you get. But the moment you are going on a date, on a one-on-one -on -one thing, it will, they will put up their best front for you. Yeah. And so I would think a, a good way is to get to know them in a group. And then when you actually think that there is an opportunity where you would want to get to know the person further, then... I think in today's context, it's really quite, uh, people, both sides can initiate, whether it's a boy or a girl, to mm. actually say, hey, what about, we? can we have a drink together? Uh, can we have dinner together? I think it's totally okay. What do you think from your perspective? Yeah, next-gen pastor. <laughs> you had to tell them what to do. Well, principle <laughs> number one says that you should consult your spiritual mentors, your pastors <laughs> and your leaders and your parents. Um, and, and I, I mean, we laugh about it, but I yeah. think that, that is a good place to start. Yeah. And I know you haven't really got into uh, uh, this particular point, but I know in your second half, you also talk a bit about the place yeah. of prayer mm. and just how praying and, and keeping a lookout and asking God to speak to us so that we are attentive to God as we're yeah. attentive to other people yeah. is also really important. So I yeah. think that's how we can start. Good um, yeah, so uh, as good a start as any if you start praying and yeah. start asking God to also speak to us. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is an interesting question, uh, Pastor Benny. Yeah. Okay, um, so this is asked from a guy's perspective by yeah. Anonymous, but it can also be asked from a girl's perspective. Okay. So let me bring on the screen and then I'll read it out for everyone. Mm. How can a guy tell that is God's will to date a particular girl rather than our earthly desires to date? Mm. Um. This is where, again, you know, that whole aspect of um, holistically looking at this. And, and I would say that um, the reason why I put out this framework of mm. these 10 keys is really to help people to kind of have a, a means of looking at the whole um, framework and to make sure that enough things there are, are landing before we actually would say, I think it's God's will for me to date this person or to, to go out with this person. Mm. Um, it's like body language, you know. You can't just go on one thing and then assume that that's what the person is going through. Yeah. Like just because he twinkles his eyes all the time, then he's sneaky for love. No, he got <laughs> sand in his eyes. <laughs> that's all. You know, so it can't be based on one thing, but it can be based on a cluster of things. Yeah. And that would give you an indication that this could be God's directing, yeah. you know, directing me towards getting to know this person. Yeah. So that's why I want to leave this as a framework for our young people as a guide yeah, uh, yeah. to help them discern. Yeah. And even though this question is posed from an angle of uh, God's will as it relates to dating, yeah. but I guess when it comes to God's will, 
it is also generic across every single aspect of our lives, isn't it? So yes. the same way in which we discern God's will mm. for our lives in other areas is yeah. the same way that we discern this particular true. issue. Yeah. So I guess the things that you said, like knowing God, mm. you know, um, and, 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 and always uh, following in obedience to God, in yes. our purity, in our body, Correct. all that is part of, of, mm. of the answers yeah. too, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's why I think it's an entire framework rather mm. than just one or two things. Yeah, yeah. We're going to one more question by uh, Anonymous again. (laughs) Anonymous uh, has uh, a lot of interesting questions today. So, Pastor Benny, what are your thoughts on dating someone whose company you enjoy, but you have no intense feeling of love uh, Mm. or infatuation towards the person? Right. Right. Mm. Actually, I think that um, the possibility could be that when we enjoy each other's company and both parties are willing to actually spend time together, it, we are building a friendship. Mm. So it's like the three C's, you know. You are, you, you are beginning to experience a chemistry. And then with the chemistry, you should now, as you spend time together, really explore the character, talk deep, and don't just always uh, have fun and, and and talk nonsense, you know, mm. talk about things that are peripheral. Mm. But follow what we talked about last week uh, in the webinar on interpersonal communication and try to go down the five levels of communication mm. and come to the point where we could begin to really know each other and experience not just facts and information, you know, but get down to feelings, emotion, get down to maximum truth, mm. get down to opinions and judgment. And from there, right, we know the person's character. And when you actually get down to maximum truth, you are exploring the core values of the person. And when all this comes together, you know um, that feeling of love, I think, is something that develops over time. And we start from that outside and we go deep on the inside and before you know it, it can develop. So I would say start with the chemistry, go to the character, get down to the core and see if the feelings will develop. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and I guess we don't make friends with the end goal of um, wanting to to be married, yeah. right? Um, it's not like every friend that we make, yeah, we plan to get everyone. married. Yeah, yeah but I, I think it's just enjoying the, in the, enjoying the company. Sometimes over time, yeah. that relationship develops. Right. But if it doesn't... Then if I, it, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it's okay. It only yeah. means that, well, that's okay. You know, maybe that's not the one, but you have made a good friend. Yeah. Yeah, and then we can explore another yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but having said that, I do know of people, uh, mm. in fact, some pastors who yeah. uh, know their wives uh, for a long time yes. as friends yeah. with, with absolutely zero interest. Absolutely. And then yeah. somehow a- along the way, through some different opportunities, a mission yes. trip, working mm. together in ministry, and you begin to see a different uh, per- side of the person. Yes. And then things just happen. Yeah. Yeah, so there's that possibility yeah, too. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes amazing how we miss the very thing before our eyes. You know, it's right there, but we're missing it. Yeah. And it just didn't happen. But sometimes you need to trust God's timing. It just, the right time, it just sparks and that's it. Yeah. Yeah, so enjoy the process. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess now is a good time as any to mm. get back into the teaching, uh, okay. which will also help to answer some of the questions that we have just raised. Mm. And then we'll come back to a time of Q&A. All right. You ready to roll on? I got a few more points just to give to you. Well, they're, they're not long, but they'll be shorter points. But important. Here's number six. Principle number six is the key of prayer. Okay, actually, this should come number one, but I put it here because I'm flowing with the text. Uh, verse 12 of the passage says, And then he prayed, Lord, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today, the servant prayed, and show kindness to my master Abraham. And in verse 62, you also find that Isaac went out to the field one evening to meditate or to pray. So you find that there was prayer going on. And while Isaac was praying, Rebekah turned up and they they set eyes on each other and voila, it happened. It was love at first sight. But please remember, it was also birth out of a prayerful search on the part of Abraham, on the part of the servant, on the part of of, uh, Isaac himself. 
You know, we can talk on and on about courtship, about dating, about romance, but ultimately, we must introduce God into our search for a life partner. The psalmist actually said, delight yourself in the Lord and He will grant you the desires of your heart. I think prayer is the key to knowing God's desire for your own heart. Now, I like this saying uh, that goes like this. Marriage means the handing over of yourself, your body, your future, your keeping to the one whom you dearly love, although this person may in many ways remain a stranger. This tremendous act of faith is something that can unlock in each lover paths of compassion, generosity, joy, passion, fidelity and hope that no one guessed was even there. And that is why the confidence of young lovers is not foolish or arrogant, but an expression of a basic fact in human experience. This is the greatest of human gifts. They are set to work only when people are prepared to risk everything. But you must first risk it before God in prayer. I like that. Marriage is a risky business. Why? Because you are handing yourself totally over to someone, to another person. And that is risky. And that's why the writer says, but first, you must risk it before God in prayer. It is in prayer that we will find safety and security. So pray before you jump. Okay, here's number seven. Here's an important virtue that is highlighted uh, in this passage. It's the virtue of kindness. It's interesting, isn't it, to note that when the servant wanted to place a test or a fleece before God, that fleece has something to do with the virtue of kindness. You know, the, 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 the moment, the, and this was what the servant, the, the servant is placing before the Lord. He says, the moment the servant asked for a drink, if this woman were to say, yes, I'll give you a drink, but more than that, I also feed your camel as well. I water your camels as well. That is the one. And so what happened when the servant met Rebecca was this. The moment the servant asked for a drink, Rebecca responded, drink, my Lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. And after he had given him a drink, she actually volunteered. She said, I will draw water for your camels too. Now, Understand, it is one thing to offer a stranger a, a drink. It's another to actually water his camels as well. You know why? Do you know how much water a camel can drink? It's actually 40 gallons. The average amount of water a camel can drink when he's thirsty is 40 gallons. How many camels did the servant have? 10 camels. So how much water are we talking about here? It's 400 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. And you notice that when she did it, she did it with great enthusiasm. Look at verse 20. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trout, ran back to the well to draw more water and drew enough for all his camels. Here is this woman that was running, you know, back and forth from the well, bringing 400 gallons of water to water the camels. How many of you know it takes genuine kindness to do this, not to mention strength. You know, it takes a lot of kindness and take a lot of strength to do this. Now, here's my point. In any relationship, there is never a reason to be unkind. You know, we can disagree, we can have conflict situation, we can argue, you know, but we can never have the right to be unkind. Whenever you see a relationship where one partner chooses to be unkind, nasty, wicked towards another, it is bound to be a miserable relationship. And I can tell you this, brothers and sisters, young people, what you see is what you get. People change, but not much. So when you are looking at a person now and you are considering the person for your life partner, if you don't see kindness and loving concern while you are not yet married, it is unlikely you'll see it after you get married. If you see uh, unkindness now, if you see a nastiness in the person's character, what you see is what you get. People change, but not much. So you better be prepared to accept what you see. If you are prepared to accept it, then you go in with your eyes open. 
but it is wisdom to look out for this indispensable virtue of kindness and grace. And I think it is really, it's like a crowning virtue, you know, of human personality. is kindness, grace. You know, whenever there is kindness, whenever there is grace, there is hope for any relationship. But where this is lacking, uh, you are in for, <laughs> you are in for uh, uh, something you have to really deal with. So number seven, the virtue of kindness. Look out for this. Here's number eight, the need for family blessing. Oh, please pay attention to this one. Look at verse 59 now. So they sent their servants, Rebekah, on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands, and may your offspring possess the gates of their enemies. Now, I know that marriage is between two persons, but it also includes the coming together of two families. So I think it's always wise, it's always good to seek the blessings of our loved ones both at home and also perhaps in church, that we have these blessings of others around us. However, the couple must ultimately make their own decision. But my advice to you young people would be this, be smart and win the hearts of the parents before marriage. Do that. Um, honouring our parents do not always mean that we must do what they say because yes, we know there is a higher law of God that rules in all of our earthly relationships, including that of parents and children. But if, so if you are asked to do something that are outside the confines of godliness, then we learn to disobey in an honourable manner. But having said that, having put that qualification there, it is always right to be honouring towards our parents. And therefore, I think if you want to have a marriage that is going to be so full of blessing, then win the hearts of the parents. Uh, always ask for the family blessing. Because it's not just about two persons coming together, although that is primary, it's also the coming together of two families. And may the Lord, you know, give us beautiful extended families through marriage as well. Here's number nine, an important one the element of timing, the element of timing. I think there's such a, such a thing as a divine timing in all of this, a, divine, a sense of divine timing. You notice a sense of timing in Abraham's heart that he knew the time has come to go and search for a, a, a wife for his son. Uh, look at the timing of the, of the servant to be at the right place at the right time to meet the right person and everything falling together. Uh, look at the, the sense of timing when Isaac will be in the field praying and then Rebecca should be coming and then they look up at the same time and then they meet each other almost at a distance and they, it, it's all happening even before they reach home. It all points to one thing, the Kairos timing of God has arrived. And I tell you this, brothers and sisters, when it comes, it comes. If you have not yet found your partner at this time, I want to encourage you to trust God's timing for your life. Trust God's timing for your search. You, know, you must really, really believe that God had your best interests at heart. You must truly, truly trust Him that His timing for you is the best. You know, I have seen people get married at very advanced age, even up to 50 years old. People found the right one at that age and get married. And it's a blissful marriage. And I want you to know, if we really, really trust God's timing for our life, then we will view singleness as a God-ordained season of our life. And the truth is this, some of us will marry early, some of us will marry later. You know, I know a pastor friend who married quite late and actually found his wife when he was already in his 40s. And, and the wife was already in, in her 40s as well. Today, they are happily married for so many years, even have children. See, and the key is this. If you are single, don't rush to, be, to get married. If you are married, stay married, okay? And if you are still single, can I challenge you also? Make the best use of your time. And next week, I'm going to devote an entire webinar for those of you who are still single and, and how you could actually be single for a season 
or you'll be single for a reason. And we'll talk about that uh, next week. But here's a peep into it. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 32 to 35. Here's a beautiful one for those who are in this season of singlehood. Think about this. I would like you to be free from concern. The Apostle Paul wrote this. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried man or woman, uh, an unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affair. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please her husband. But I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but so that you may live in the right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So I'm not playing down on marriage. I'm a married man myself, right? So, and it's God's will, you know, that man is made for woman, etc. And I'm not playing down on marriage at all. But all I'm saying is, there are, if this is a season for you where you are going through singlehood, make the best of it. This is the best time, therefore, for you to know God and to serve Him. It's the best time for you to give to the Lord undivided devotion. So we all need to stop having this mentality. All I need is a man. No, all I need is a woman mentality. Because in the end, we may just tie ourselves up, rushing from one short-term relationship to another. And that's not profitable at all. So here's my challenge to you young people. Hey, trust God's timing and enjoy singleness as a gift of God for this season in your life. Now, be on the lookout and be, be exploring, but until the right one comes along, enjoy the season. Trust His timing. Be content in every circumstance. Because the truth is this, if we are not content when we are single, you are not likely to be content when you are married. It is about two holes coming together to make a better hole. It's not two halves coming together. We are complete in ourselves, but two is better than one. Always have that mentality. My hope, your hope, is not in marriage, but your hope is in the one who is going to make it happen. That's where your hope is. There. So value this principle of timing, divine timing. Can I leave you one last one before we go to your questions? And of course, the one big question everybody is asking by now will be this. Where in the world do I find all these desirable guys and girls? Where do I find them? Well, well, well. The answer is, principle number 10, is the place of the well. <laughs> it's the place of the well. You know, I, you know what I found interesting? What I found interesting is that many men of God actually found their wives at the well. You know, Abraham did. Jacob did, Moses did, and of course, Isaac did. They all found their spouses at the well. Uh, you see already in Genesis 24, 11, the, the servant positioned himself at the well, you know, and he, uh, he had the camels kneel down near the wells outside the town. It was towards evening, the time when the women could go out to draw water. So where did um, Isaac found his wife. He was actually at the well, right? Genesis 29, verse 9, tell us that Jacob actually met his future wife, Zipporah, also at the well, where he rescued her from a group of hooligan shepherds. And because they rescued her, that's where they met, at the well. Exodus chapter 2, verse 15, tell us Moses, oh, sorry, Moses actually met his future wife, Zipporah, there, when he... Um, rescued her from a group of uh, shepherds. But Genesis 29 verse 9, Jacob met his future wife, Rachel, at the well also when he came to water the sheep. So it seems to me, like the, there's a principle here, that the well is the most common place where men of God found their spouses, <laughs> found their wives. So here's my uh, advice to you. The well is the place to meet your future partner. Go to the well. 
And, and please know uh, the well is not a pub somewhere. Okay, it's not a pub somewhere. The million dollar question people will ask then: Where is this well today? If I know where that well is, I'll hang around there all the time. Okay, I'll tell you where the well is. I think in principle, the well is a place where the community gathers because that's where the community gathers at a well uh, in, in ancient time. The well is the place where the people are find refreshment. Okay, that's where they get their water. That's where they socialize. That's where they interact. The well is a place where you can find water. Okay, the well is a place of rest. Even Jesus found rest by the well in John chapter 4, verse 6, right? Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. Okay, and the well is where you find rest. Now, where does all this point you to? <laughs> I think the well is a picture of the church. Okay, the well is a picture of the church. And brothers and sisters, the best place to look for your future spouse is in the church. And it need not just be your own local church, although that is where you are likely to find those that will share the same passion, the same uh, mission as you because you are in the same local church. Our destiny is tied up with the local church that we belong to. But some of your spouses, you know, some of you who are in, in churches today, some of your future spouse may be right under your nose, okay? Right under your nose. You just haven't seen it. Not in your nose, under your nose, okay? And you haven't seen it, that's all. So you just keep on pursuing after the knowledge of God. You keep on engaging in this knowledge of your master. You keep on engaging in the mission that he has given to you. And for all you know, your mate will show up. Okay, because you are right at the well. So keep on pursuing after the knowledge of God and the purposes of the kingdom. And as you serve the Lord at the well, your Rebecca, your Rachel's, your Zipporah's might just come along. Hang around the well and your Jacob's, your Moses, your Isaac's may just turn up. So we pray and we wait in faith and we trust God's timing. You trust the outcome to the Lord. And here's the thing I want to leave you with. Restedness should be the state of our mind as we wait for God to send along our path the right life partner. You should be rested and not restless while you're waiting, while you're searching, while you're watching. Have that restedness inside. Genesis chapter 2, verse 21. Listen to this. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, while he was resting, he took one of the men's ribs, closed up the place with flesh, and then the Lord made a woman from the rib that he has taken from the man. You know, when did Eve come to Adam? It was when he was resting. And the key is this. We are rested while we are waiting. We are rested, not worried, not anxious. We are rested and not desperate because people can smell the desperation. So I'd rather be rested. And then perhaps the best thing to do, pray what the servant prayed in Genesis 24, 12. Oh Lord God of my master Abraham, give me success today. Let me be found in the right place at the right time. And then... It will, harm. it will happen, you know. So I give you this framework of these 10 things as a framework. And let's just run through it one more time. These 10 simple principles, okay? The wisdom of seeking counsel. Don't miss that. This is so important. Don't go it alone, but take time to talk to your pastors, talk to your pastors your parents and talk to your mentors so that they can guide you in your search. Number two, be the, maintain the principle of being equally yoked. Remember the chair? Uh, it is much easier for you to be pulled down than for you to try and pull up. So why, be, be equally yoked and you're going to find great joy because you have common values and common core principles. Okay, number three, it's the beauty of purity. Maintain your chastity so that you can give it as your best gift for your future uh, spouse. And remember, worship is, sex is as compared to worship. So that's how critical it is. Number four, it's the benefit of shared inheritance. Master, mission, mate. 
chemistry, character and core. Those are all important. Number five, the presence of willingness. Don't marry because, don't settle. In the end, you marry because you want to, not because you have to. Number six is the key of prayer. Marriage is such a risky thing. So whatever you do, risk it first before God in prayer. The virtue of kindness. Um, of all the virtue, this is crowning. Grace, kindness, wherever is present, there is hope for any relationship. Okay, and number, number eight, it's a need for family blessing. Okay, we, it's not just the coming together of two persons, it's a coming together of two families. Seek your family's blessing before marriage. Number nine, it's the element of timing. Trust God's timing and therefore be rested while you're waiting. And number 10, hang around the well. Okay, hang around the well because that's where they may show up. Thank you so much for listening tonight. And I'm going to try and tackle some of your questions together with Dan. So I hand this time back to Dan. Uh, thank you, Pastor Benny. This, this particular session today, I think it's not just informative. I think it's also transformative. Uh, I think God. there's been a lot of uh, hope. There's been a lot of, I think, peace that has been given to people. As you said, set mm. some of them free, some yeah. of us free. And then also the place of rest is also important as yes. a place of beginning mm. for some of us as we are looking to get into relationships. Mm. So this particular webinar is very interesting because I have never seen so many votes for the questions. For, for whatever <laughs> reason, whether you are voting because you're all in the same room voting for one another's <laughs> question, but it's so fascinating. Um, yeah. Now, the first question at the top uh, is a question posted by our kinetic female leaders. So shout out okay. to all of you who are in the same awesome. house. Uh, there must be some uh, upvoting happening in that house <laughs> massively. Uh, Here's the question that is actually being asked by our female kinetic leaders. Okay. So Pastor Benny, to mm. what extent should a girl mm. lead or take initiative in a relationship, mm. spiritually as well? Okay. Um, now, when it comes to, say, initiating a dating situation, or you want to go out and you want to ask the, the boy, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So I want to free you up to be able to do that so that you, because I do recognize that sometimes the boys uh, these days, sometimes I want to smack them over the head <laughs> because there are so many beautiful girls in the church and they are not taking any action. <laughs> so sometimes I do want to give them a little <laughs> shake and wake them up on this. But uh, having said that, having said that, um, I, 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 I would want to say that you, know, you are free to, to initiate anything like that. But at the same time, um, I think God has also wired a man to be hunters. <laughs> uh, we are meant to hunt. And because of that, um, it's great you know, when the man can do the chasing and the hunting. Uh, that's just how men are. And, and men, I, I want to encourage you that you are meant to take the lead. You are meant to hunt and you should take initiative to do that as much as the moment um, the Lord will direct you and you feel at peace, you know, don't hesitate but go for it <laughs> because I think God has wired us to be hunters, you know, and that is the reason why, you know, sometimes people complain to me that um, um, in the beginning, I notice how courtship works. You know, in the beginning, it seems like the the man is very anxious, and the girl seems to take it very easy, and the man is constantly getting jealous all the time over the girl, and then after a while, the the table will turn. Now it's the girl that gets a lot of jealousy, and especially if they are already settled. You know, if they are like they already agreed that they are together. Uh, or if they say, for example, they already got engaged or they are married and now the table turn is the girl that gets really jealous of the guy. Why? Because that's how men are wired. They are hunters, you know, and so when they start hunting, they really get very possessive of the girl and they get upset about the way they dress, about the way they talk to other guys, the way they look at other guys, or when other guys look at the girl, they get really jealous and upset. And then the girl is wondering, why is this guy so possessive and holding on to me so tight? And then, But after a while, when the relationship settles and he knows he already got her heart, now he eases off. And now the girl gets insecure. And then the girl is wondering, why is he changing? Now he's no longer that caring, is no longer that concerned. And that's when the girl gets possessive. 
And that's when the girl starts to get jealous. And now the guy is feeling, why is this girl so possessive? You know, I can't handle her. And that is where a lot of relationships begin to fracture. But actually, it's just a process that of a hunter and the, and the hunted. <laughs> and it's a dance that we all go through uh, yeah. until we all settle and then we all get married. So here's my thing. Uh, I want to encourage all the guys to be the hunter that you were meant to be. And for the girls, that there's nothing wrong with you initiating something, uh, but in the end, let the guy hunt because that's what they're wired to do, I believe. And when you do that, um, uh, it'll be more fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, and I, I don't know, but that's how I've been brought up and that's how I've seen it happen. Yeah. And it seems to operate that way. And when that happens also, when you get to the... When you actually get married, uh, I actually really think that the man needs to lead. And the man needs to spiritually lead the family, lead the wife as well. Yeah. You know, what's your thought on this, uh, Dan? I, I think from a practical perspective, um, it's, it definitely makes sense to me that a female, a girl, mm. can take the lead as well. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and it's not to say something like, I love you. So it doesn't yeah. ha even have to be as straightforward as that. Mm. Uh, there's a Chinese saying that I've heard that in this world, there are no ugly girls, <laughs> only lazy ones. And that's to do with the makeup. So a little bit of makeup will go a long way, even if it's just doing a little bit. That's you taking initiative yeah. or asking the person out for coffee, right. staying back a little bit longer mm. after kinetic, you know, uh, after church meetings yeah. um, and having a conversation in a group. I think all those things are part of yes. a girl also being able to take the initiative. Mm. Yeah. So hopefully that will give um, some of us some <laughs> practical handles as to how we can uh, uh, and, take the next step. And boys, please, go on the hunt. <laughs> if you are the right age and you're ready, go on the hunt. Well, Pastor Benny, here's another mm. question that has 31 votes uh, yeah. by um, uh, one of our watchers, uh, one of our viewers called okay. Dai. Um, so D.Y. Dai, uh, mm. he's asking this question or she's asking this question, where do you draw the line between compromising and acceptance? I think may maybe this is more to do mm. with uh, the other person. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe something you don't like about a person yep. or you see that as a flaw. Mm -hmm. How do you draw the line mm. between compromising and acceptance? Yeah. Um, my challenge to people who are actually making a decision on a life partner um, if there is any doubt at all in your mind that you are actually compromising, then I would say, hold on to it. Uh, hold on. Um, don't jump in and make the commitment yet because you need to come to a point where you know that it is acceptance and not try to think that it is acceptance when you are actually unsure. Mm. Because... The, the choice of a life partner is such a critical decision that I don't think we, can, we should settle. <laughs> don't settle. But um, unless, uh, until you are sure that it is either this is not for you and you walk away from it, or you reach the point where you say, this is really something I can accept, then I think you can proceed. But if not, uh, don't settle. That would be my counsel. Um, because I think that is such an important decision that once you make that decision, um, of all the decisions that you make, this is one that has no turning back. So I would not want to settle. Mm. But I would either come to a place where I say, this cannot work anymore, and therefore, let's remain friends and we can break it off. Or... We reach this place in the depths of our heart to be able to say that I'm not compromising, but I've come to be able to accept this, then move on. So that would be, uh, that's where I would stand with that. Yeah, no, that's yeah. good, that's good. <laughs> and also some of the principles that you have taught us today, like yeah. um, asking counsel, yes. I think that also helps. Yeah, because sometimes absolutely. when we are so emotionally uh, uh, tied with right. somebody else, mm. then uh, the way we see the person can also get coloured through our own emotional lenses. Right. And having a third person, especially a spiritual yes. counsel's perspective, will mm. really help. Absolutely. So it's actually a good practice during courtship to actually have someone who is journeying with you. An older person, a, a spiritual mentor, someone like that, who is journeying with you mm. through that process of courtship. Yeah. And it might actually be a great guide uh, along the way. You know? So 
when I was courting, uh, I did have a mentor. And so sometimes when we reach a, a head and we are not sure if this is for it, uh, this, we should continue or not, seek counsel. And they actually were able to speak into our situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Um, the next most popular question uh, is once again from our kinetic female leaders. Okay. Um, and this question goes like this. Yeah. What happens if there's a situation where it's the right person, but the wrong timing? Right person, wrong, wrong timing. timing. Um, okay, I would assume that it's because you feel you're too young, right? At this stage, <laughs> and, uh, it's not the right time uh, to, to actually be in a courting relationship. And here again, I go back to principle number nine. There is a principle of divine timing and trust God's timing. You know, sometimes if it's the right person, um, and you really um, think that that person is suitable for you, but it's not the right time, you trust God's timing and believe that and trust that if it's really meant for you, if this is really the one that God intended for you and you actually chosen, it will be preserved. But if it is not, then let it go because there could be somebody else that will come along the way. Mm. But never rushed in when it is not the right time. So I would always advocate trusting God's timing yeah. so that we know it is His time, not just hit the right person, but also the right timing. Yeah, mm. no, that's right. Yeah. And, and also one of the things that I remember you talking about today is about the issue of purity. Yeah. And I think timing also has oh, a big part absolutely. in that, right? Oh, so so right. wrong timing is, let's say, when you're 12, 13, 14, yeah. 15, and then how much can you go yes. before you hit the roadblock? Right. Absolutely. And also that the that ability to manage your emotions are still not there. So in terms of being able to manage some of these emotions that comes with courtship, mm. when you are too young, you may not be able to manage it. And how do you control the uh, adrenaline, you know, and, and all that when you are young and there is that curiosity about the physical aspect of the relationship as well. When you're so young, you're just unable to manage some of these things. And a lot of people do fall into um, wrong you know, physical relationship because they could not manage their emotion. Yeah. So yeah. you're absolutely right. So don't start when he's too young. Yeah. And this is where you need to listen to your parents because they know best. <laughs> yeah, and your pastor yeah. apparently. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Um, a question from Anonymous. Mm. So Anonymous is asking, practically, what does spiritually leading look like? How does this apply to both the man or the woman in the relationship? Yeah. Spiritually leading. Mm. Yeah. So I would think that um, if you are spiritually leading your family, you would be the one that um, as a man, right? Let's say as a husband now. Uh, I lead my family in three ways if I can just paint a picture for you. One, I need to be a priest that represents my family before God and represent God before my family. And that's what a priest does. So as a, as a priest, I need to be praying for my family. So I lead my family by praying for them, praying with them. Number two, I need to be a prophet. What does a prophet do? A prophet represents God before his family, uh, before the people. The same way as a prophet in the home, I need to represent God before my family and I need to speak God's word to them, God's will to them. I need to be able to represent the heart of God to my family and that I think is critical. Uh, so I'm a priest that represents my family before God in prayer. I'm a prophet that represents God before my family through speaking to them about God's will, about God's ways, about who God is and represent God correctly before them. And number three, I need to be a king that will lead and rule my family with love and grace. Uh, I lead them uh, by, by um, leading them uh, according to the ways that God will lead His people. So my, my, I take my model uh, from... Um, Psalm 78, 70, uh, where the scripture says that uh, King David led or shepherded the people of God with integrity of heart and with skillful hands. So I want to be able to lead my family uh, with wholeness of heart, 
and with skillful hands so that I, I make good decisions for them. Uh, I make good decisions with them and I want to be able to lead them out of a heart that truly love and, and care for them. So those are the three things, three pictures I, I, I use uh, in terms of leadership. Uh, I want to be a priest, a prophet and a king as I lead my family, lead my wife. Yeah. So hope that's helpful. It is helpful, Pastor, but then um, would you say the same thing then can be applied to a woman in the relationship or does it look different? For I think for the woman, I think she also represents these things to her children. Hmm. And of course, she can also be a, a partner, a helper, help me to the, to the husband. But as a wife, I want to be able to allow room for my husband to lead and to be able to give him the privilege of leading. And that is something which, as a wife, uh, we had to learn how to do that, even though by personality, we may be a leader <laughs> by personality. And I do know that there are some very, very gifted women and that could do all these things very well before the family. But if the husband is wanting to lead or willing to lead, we make room for her for the husband to do so. And the, and the wife should never, never put down the husband uh, before the children or before anybody, but always lifting him up. You know? And even though she can do a better job than him in some of these things, <laughs> she will never have this one upmanship with the husband, but always giving room for the husband to lead. And in so doing, I think we model for our children, hmm. we model for the next generation what it can be. Yeah. Yeah. So then spiritually, spiritually leading in a family or in a relationship yep. is not just men and women, but then really is a partnership. Yep. We're leading spiritually together. Yeah. No, that's really, really good. Um, now we have a few more minutes for questions. And if you have a question that you're, you really want to have answered, you can vote for the question. Mm. Uh, and then with the one at the top is something that we will look at first. And then we can probably try to get to those questions. So at the top right now uh, is another question by Anonymous. Yep. They ask this question, can soul ties be formed without sexual intimacy? Yes. Uh, good question. And I have to say that um, soul ties can also be formed without sexual intimacy because there's such a thing as spiritual adultery. Mm. There is physical adultery where a soul tie is formed through the sexual act, but there's also spiritual adultery. Um, where, Take for example... Um, Soul ties happen when there's bonding that takes place between two persons. And how that happens is because of frequency and intensity. So we have very intense time with another person and we also have that very frequently. Then the two hands come together and make a noise and you form a tie, you form a bond. And once that bond happens, then it becomes a soul tie and it's there already. And this soul tie, if it, is, if it becomes unhealthy, now there are healthy soul ties where it's, it comes out of a right relationship and you need to be bonded. So that I have soul ties with my children, I have soul ties even with you as a good friend, mm -hmm. we can have ties, you know. But when it becomes unhealthy, it is when that soul tie uh, begins to, Im to infringe into people's uh, territory, mm -hmm. uh, private space, you know, and that can happen. Um, say, for example, you can have colleagues, you know, that come into a soul tie situation and they are so close that they actually breach the, they cross the line. And after a while, emotionally, they are so tied together that they almost could read one another's mind. And it's actually very, very unhealthy hmm. because I think that only should happen uh, between husbands and wives when we are meant to two shall become one. But when that happens with, say, someone who is not... Uh, and then we begin to read each other's mind. You could almost look at a person and you could tell what they want. It's actually quite scary. And you, you actually could be crossing the line hmm. and forming an unhealthy uh, soul tie. And I would put it this way. If I can maybe draw a picture here, uh, just, just to make this clear. Uh, an unhealthy soul tie is something like this, you know. It's like a screw that has been put into, screw into a wall. And you know how is it like when you have a screw and then it is not put in properly 
the more you screw, mm. the worse it gets. And when you have a wrong bond, something like this, and it becomes unhealthy, the more you screw, the worse it gets. How do you actually get rid of it? It's by unscrewing it. And then you can re-engage properly. That's the only way. So what I'm trying to say is that if you already have a soul tie, unhealthy soul tie with someone other than your spouse, then I would encourage you, stop whatever you are doing right now. If you have been having meals with the same person and, with, and it's not meant to be a tie there, like another person's wife or something like that, it's not meant to be your tie, but you're allowing it to happen, stop whatever you are doing that is causing this bonding, this frequency intensity to happen. Mm -hmm. Stop it. Because if you don't, if you think that now I know I can handle it, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Because it's a, if you have engaged wrongly already, you need to unscrew, detach it, stop it, and then you can re-engage better in future. Now, it's, uh, it's different when it's your spouse. It's different when it is, it's a bond that's meant to happen mm. because it's the right relationship. So, I, I would say that, uh, please watch out for this. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a good question, a really good question. Can soul ties be formed without sexual relationship? Can, yeah. because it has happened spiritually. Yeah. It has happened emotionally. Yeah. And, and I guess, Pastor Benny, the, the follow-up question, which is actually yeah. one of uh, uh, the, the questions that's at the top, mm. is how do you break soul ties? So you mentioned stop what you're doing. Yes. Is there more that we can do? Um, how about... Uh, those that have uh, trans has passed the boundaries of sexual, uh, you know, okay. boundaries. Mm. Then you really need to detach completely and actually go through a cold turkey, uh, because relationships are like that. You know, you, it, once you're already bonded, it's hard to it, it's hard to say let's remain friends. You mm. simply had to detach and be completely have no contact, at least for extended period of time, long enough for the tie to break. And then number two, go for prayer. You know, go for counselling, get prayer so that you can break that soul tie in Jesus' name and free yourself. Yeah. There is a need for that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's something, if anybody is in that situation, seek help yeah. and go for it. Uh, detach, separate completely through an extended period of time and then seek help, get ministry. Yeah. And so you can free ourselves from yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this is a good time to also mention that mm. um, as you are praying, um, uh, if you're in other churches, there's not FCC, do take time and consider mm. uh, reaching out to your leader, your pastor, yes. your mentors. Yeah. And if you're in FCC or if you're in the city of Perth, then do reach out to your leaders. Or if not, then um, FCC as well um, via the email or via the, the phone line and uh, do seek one of our counsellors to yes. help you along with the healing process. Amen. Um, we do have time for um, at least uh, one more question. Okay. And this question is by Anonymous, uh, okay. asking what healthy, what healthy physical and emotional boundaries should I impose pre mm. and during the dating phase? Mm. Talking yeah. about boundaries within uh, the, the, the pre and the during of the yeah. dating. Yeah. This is a hard question to draw a line because the moment we think like that we already have a line mentality that's true and that line mentality um actually uh, we are already presupposing that we will push the boundary to the furthest we can go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's almost like you know how near to the edge of the cliff do i want to drive before i will fall over <laughs> Uh, okay, now I'm, 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 I'm making an assumption here because that may not be your intent at all, but yes, really seeking to provide good boundaries uh, for, for courting couples. Um, this is really hard to draw a line here. <laughs> uh, but I would say that if you're really prayerful about the relationship um, and as you progress on, I think naturally the physical... Uh, the need for physical touch grows over time. So holding hands, yeah. hands over the shoulder, maybe a peck on the cheek, and then you end up, you know, going beyond that. Um, but I would say this, you know, if we are really prayerful about our relationship and each time we come together, we know that God is with us and God is in this relationship. 
the moment you feel the prompting of the Lord, the moment you feel the check of the Holy Spirit, draw that line there. Yeah. Okay, just draw that line. And it's better to be safe than sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And I would think that um, once you go beyond kissing and you start to pet and you go into other things, you have just, you are, you are going to go into a place where the emotions will take over. So I would be careful and really feel the check of the Holy Spirit at that point. Because once we go beyond that, you will, we start to, the body takes over almost. Yeah. And, and at least that's my experience. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. would say it's something we, we had to watch. Yeah, and you did mention during your teaching that mm. uh, being alone, being yeah. in, a, in a room, mm. uh, uh, I mean, uh, the way I'm hearing it also is like even being in a dark place. Yeah. Uh, also things that you might not want to go into, especially for guys yeah. who might be more uh, physically driven. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and can I add this, add this for this one? Um, generally speaking, girls, ladies, you need to be the referee in this thing. You need to be the referee because the guys are natural hunters and they tend, we will tend to want to go as far as we can go. And you need to be firm in saying no. Mm. stop this, you know, this is where we draw the line and you need to referee that and you need to love yourself, ladies. Love yourself, respect yourself and the, the guys will let that, will that nature take its course but the girls need to be the ones that would actually say, this is where we draw the line. Yeah. 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 And don't let him, don't let the guy threaten you into anything beyond that. Yeah. Because you draw the line, yeah. because you love and respect yourself. Yeah, amen. So, yeah. So if he's threatening you or being disrespectful to you, mm -hmm. just want to let you know that you are worthy of respect, yep. and that you can say no. And for the guys, you should never disrespect a girl that yep. way. So drawing boundaries Absolutely. is something that both sides will have to do. Amen. Yeah. Well. Um, that's all the time that we have for tonight. And it's been so good having all of us here on this um, uh, amazing webinar that has been so helpful, I think, for a lot of us. Um, but this is not the end of the conversation. We can still continue to have this conversation with your leaders, with your local churches, in your small groups, in your connect groups. Mm. Uh, and let this conversation continue to grow as we all discern what the will of God is in terms of our dating life. And for next week's webinar, it yeah. will be Let's Talk About Singlehood. So as Pastor Benny mentioned, we're talking about what it means for us to be, in, to be still single in this season mm. or for a mm. reason. And yeah. there's always something that God has in store for us, no matter what season we're in. Mm. So if you're still single, you want to look out for that, or uh, if you know somebody who could be blessed by the webinar, go ahead and share it. Mm -hmm. And our social media channels, uh, you will want to stay on our social media channels. Follow us on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, where we will have our live streaming coming up on Sundays, as well as the Amen. updates on the webinars next week. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Pastor Benny. Uh, do you You're have welcome. any parting words for our viewers? Well, thank you so much for joining me all these uh, weeks and uh, next week even though it's for on singlehood it doesn't mean you need to be a single to come and uh, join in on this because um, there are we have many many friends and, and it can be good pointers that we can use to guide others as well so come along and join us we have a good conversation next week thank you we'll see you then god bless you all